What is up guys, Doc in Progress here. Welcome to the video. For all you new viewers out there, my name is Sham. I'm a third year medical student from the Mayo Clinic. Um, I'm sorry this video has taken so long to put out, but third year, as can be expected, is quite busy. Uh, super fun, super enjoyable, just time consuming. Um, so this is the official video of how to score a 265 plus on the step one. If you haven't watched my step one score reveal or my thoughts video, uh, I recommend watching those. Those are the two videos before this one. Um, and if you haven't subscribed yet, please hit that button because it would really mean a lot to me. And I put out content as much as I possibly can. So um, without further ado, let's get started. First thing, uh, I have a giveaway and I'm very excited to do this for you guys. So what we're gonna do is when we hit 1,000 subscribers, which is 400 subs away, we will be giving away a UWorld subscription for a year. Um, it's either going to be for the MCAT, step one or step two. It's just gonna be based on who wins it. Uh, so if you're an undergrad student or a medical student, I highly recommend you sign up for this giveaway. And how do you do that? All you gotta do is like this video and comment below why you want to be a doctor. It's as easy as that. And also comment, you know, which one of those subscriptions you would want. Uh, and once we hit 1,000 subscribers, I'll randomly draw a name and we'll get you set up with that. And then we have two more giveaways, which I will announce once we do the 1,000 subscriber giveaway. But we have a 5,000 and a 10,000 subscriber giveaway. And let me tell you guys, it just keeps getting better. Um, so stay tuned. So the first thing I wanted to do for this video was kind of give a brief outline of what I did before going more in depth um, into each before going in depth into each resource. So how I studied was basically for the first, you know, I entered med school and for the first two classes, uh, I used Anki, which is gonna be the kind of the core resource of everything I talk about. Um, but I made my own cards for Anki. And so my first two classes were histology and anatomy. And a dedicated histology class, uh, you know, I don't know if your school has it, but there's no real histology on the step one exam. There is pathology on step one that requires histological knowledge, but you really kind of learn that in path in each organ system. So for this histology class, it was very, you know, med school related. And so I made my own cards based on med school slides and stuff like that. And for anatomy, our anatomy class is uh, seven weeks of basically anatomy, just anatomy, everything anatomy. And then we kind of reiterate in each organ system, but we don't do it by block in regards to anatomy, technically. So for that class too, I used class slides and you know netters and all that stuff to make my own cards for Anki. And so I did well in those classes, but by the end of that, I realized that, you know, yeah, it's med school, it has to be busy, but I kind of want a life, you know, I, I want my life back. I don't want to always be making cards, doing cards, this and that. And, you know, sometimes you can't help it, but in this case you can because we have this beautiful med school community and undergrad community, uh, medicine community, in which we all have a ton of stuff to learn and we all want to give back to each other, which is how it should be. Collaboration is what will make this life easier for all of us who are in pursuit of this wonderful, beautiful profession. Um, but basically, you know, there are pre-made decks and uh, I took advantage of those. So the pre-made deck that I used for the rest of medical school after anatomy during first and second year was Zonki. Uh, there was no firecracker or there was no, um, sorry, I couldn't remember the name of the other deck and I just had to look it up, but light year was the other deck. Um, there was no light year when I started Zonki, so Originally, I really didn't have a choice. There was like frozen cephalon and all that, but Zonki was really the apex predator. Uh, then uh, Lightyear came out. Uh, I was using Zonki already very religiously, and I didn't feel like switching was a good choice, and I'm happy I stuck with Zonki. I did take a look at Lightyear. I didn't like it as much as Zonki, and we'll go more into that later. Um, but basically, I used Zonki for every single class as my core, and Zonki, of course, has like first aid, pathoma, a bunch of resources mixed in. Um, that allow you to kind of review things. 
I never once really open first aid to read it. I think that's a bad idea. And again, we'll go more into that later. But I used, um, I used Zonki. And then I also used Pethoma. I watched the videos. Uh, Pethoma is for pathology, for pathology in any organ system. And then I used um, Boards and Beyond to learn physiology for the organ blocks. And uh, I think that worked out really well. Uh, Boards and Beyond does have pathology videos that can teach you pathology, but I felt Pathoma was superior in that regard. So I used Pathoma specifically for path. And then I used Boards and Beyond for physiology. And then other than that, I used Sketchy for farm and micro. And that was, I mean, unreal. I, I think that's the only real way to learn micro and farm. I don't even know how anyone learned it before us. Uh, to this day in clinicals, I think about sketchy videos when I think about pharmacology and microbiology. Um, but of course I only watched those videos once. I didn't waste my time watching them over and over. I used Zonki and I used Pepper. I used Pepper for microbiology and I used Zonki for pharmacology and those link up to the sketchy videos. And then I did those cards to keep on, you know, refreshing. And then in terms of questions, I used UWorld solely as my question bank. Uh, and we're going to get more into details with that as well. But that's my basic outline. Sanki, Pathoma, Boards and Beyond, Sketchy, and UWorld. So now let's kind of break it down. So of course, all of us have class. Class exists in med school. Some med schools make it mandatory, some don't. Um, I think it's more progressive to make them not mandatory, but some schools stick to a more traditional setting, which is kind of like my school. My school lectures are mandatory. Um, but what happened is that I, and quite a few people, you know, as people who are going into the medical profession feel that it's important to learn how to self-learn. You have to be able to teach yourself certain things and that's true whether you go to the lectures or not because you just cannot be taught the breadth and, of, and quantity of information that you are given in medical school in a, in a lecture setting. You have, there's, there's obviously outside study. And so what I really learned throughout medical school is that, yeah, lectures are great and the professors are brilliant. They're physicians, you know, they know their stuff. They know their specialty super well. But the problem is you have to learn multiple things. You have to learn multiple specialties. And you know, the example I use is multiple myeloma. I am at the Mayo Clinic and I have the privilege of learning from literally the world leaders in certain things. And one of those things is multiple myeloma. And we had like three days of lecture on multiple myeloma, whereas on step one, the only important thing you have to know about it is a single acronym. Um, and that would take like three minutes to learn at most, like maybe 30 seconds, honestly. And that's kind of like multiple myeloma in a nutshell and all you need to know for step one. And the problem with this kind of lecture approach is that you waste a lot of time learning the nitty gritty of things that will be important if you go into that subspecialty, but they're not necessarily important for step one. And you need to use your time efficiently because I personally believe that burnout comes from wasting too much time on things that don't matter. Um, so my whole thought process was to learn as efficiently as possible and learn the most high yield things. And yes, there is arguments that, hey, you know, lecture will teach you things that will help you on step one. And I agree, there are certain, you know, pearls that professors will share with you that they've learned in their clinical practice that may spark something in your mind during a step one question, but you have to think of the opportunity cost. You can learn what you might learn in a lecture, a four hour lecture in really an hour, I would say, when you get efficient at it. And that's what I got to at the end, you know, like I'm learning a four hour lecture in 30 minutes and then I have three and a half hours to do whatever I want with my life, whether it be exercise, watch Netflix, things for my wellness. So what I recommend is if you go to a school where lecture isn't mandatory, start early to learning how to learn effectively. And you have, you know, I, I would say lecture slides are pretty 
useless in general just because the information is normally presented in a kind of cluttered fashion that isn't really efficient. Um, the resources we can get from the outside are are probably better for learning stuff for step one. But if you enjoy watching lecture, and sometimes that's what I like to do, just listen. Um, you have recorded lectures, and even if you go to a mandatory place, you might have recorded lectures. Um, but if you're at a non-mandatory place, listen to the lecture on two times speed. You don't need to go to lecture. After you listen to it on two times speed, three times speed, and you've heard it, you know, do your real learning. And then you'll have extra time to do what you want with life. If you go to a school where lecture is mandatory, it's kind of tough, you know, tough luck. Um, if it's the rule, go to lecture. Um, I was lucky enough where there were a lot of professors I had, especially towards the last six months before STEP, that were like, we don't care if you come to lecture or not, do what is best for you. And I opted to not go to lecture because I was given that choice by my professors. And I can tell you, those were the most efficient six months of my life. I didn't look at PowerPoints. I mean, I didn't even look at PowerPoints when I went to the mandatory lectures, but I had to sit there because that's the rule. And that's what I signed up for when I signed up to go to this medical school. And so I would sit there, I'd listen-ish, and you know, I would do Anki cards, which I'm sure a lot of you that do Anki that go to a school with mandatory lecture will know that if you look at the crowd, if you sit in the back, uh, 40 out of 50 people aren't paying attention to the lecture they're doing Anki cards or learning from a different resource and spending their time doing other things. Now, I would do Anki cards and kind of listen and pick up pearls here and there. And yeah, uh, probably out of two years of lecture, let's say one and a half years, because I didn't even go to the last six months of lecture or after they made it not mandatory, those professors, um, I would say there was probably like three questions on step one where a pearl I learned in lecture came in handy. Otherwise, it was all my own studying. Um, so, my basic point is if you can not go to lecture, don't go to lecture. Uh, what, you can watch the lecture on two times speed, three times speed, but efficiency is the name of the game. If you go to a lecture that's mandatory, if you go to a school where lectures are mandatory, go. I don't recommend using PowerPoints, period, whether you go to a non-mandatory or mandatory school, because PowerPoints are, I believe, a bad way to focus information in medical school. I don't believe it, it, it does that successfully. And so use other resources. Look at your syllabus. You will know what you're learning for the whole entire block. So if you're gonna, if the next day is on multiple myeloma, take those three minutes to learn the multiple myeloma acronym. If it's on, you know, systolic heart failure, the day before, learn systolic heart failure on your own using the resources from the outside world and then go to lecture and listen or do Anki. But the point, as I've said, was I think lecture is an old way of teaching. I think it's effective for a very small proportion of people that go to medical school. So if you can, you know, get away with not going, don't go. If it's mandatory, go, but recognize that you should be proactive in your own learning and figuring out what's important and not important. Now we'll kind of go into the resources I used and exactly how I implemented it. So like I said, the first two blocks, I foolishly was making my own cards, which I kind of had to again because histology and anatomy are their own kind of thing. Um, but Anki is the resource you must use in medical school. There's a saying my anatomy professor, who was also my histology professor, one of them at least, um, used to say, and we used to kind of take it as a joke when we said, what should we learn about this, this specific thing? He used to say, learn everything. And we all would laugh and, you know, we'd be like, oh, we're a little overwhelmed, oh, we're not gonna learn everything. But guys, we have been blessed with a resource that allows us to learn it all. A resource that has faced repetition. I'm not being sponsored by Anki. Anki is not a paid resource either, other than if you buy the app on your phone, which I recommend also, obviously, so you can work, study on the go or study on your computer, whatever you need. But this resource allows you to get all the knowledge you need to continuously learn. This is what medicine is all about. Integrating knowledge in a longitudinal fashion and just learning it and, and really having it reiterated in your mind. 
That's what clinical medicine is like. Now that I'm in third year, you know, it's even more apparent. Like, you see the patient with heart failure once, okay. Twice, okay. Ten times, you're starting to see patterns. The pa these patterns are what allow you to learn, to create that vignette so that when the person comes in that you don't know what the diagnosis is, that's how you come up with your differential. Your brain brings all this information in because you've seen it multiple times. The best doctors are the most experienced doctors because they've seen it all. It's not the smartest doctors. It's the people who have seen it, okay? So what I recommend doing is using Anki. I'm just gonna say that flat out. And if you choose not to use Anki in medical school, I think you're foolish, period. I'm just gonna say it to you. Anki is the most efficient and the most brilliant way to learn because of the repetition. And you always have a condensed form of all the information you need. Now Zanki, I still recommend that over Lightyear and I'll tell you why. Lightyear I feel has too much repetition in terms of it has like five cards on the same thing saying it in a little bit of a different way and I don't like that personally. I, again, that takes away the efficiency. You're moving away. Repetition is good until the efficiency starts dropping. On top of that, it has the beyond part of Boards and Beyond because Lightyear is based on Boards and Beyond. So yeah, the unlocking of the cards is easy because it's based on the video you watch in Boards and Beyond, but you have that extra information that really isn't that important for step one. Whereas I feel Zonki is very targeted. And yeah, eventually a new deck will come out that's probably better than both of them. And so, you know, if you're watching this three years, four years down the line, my recommendation is you look for that deck because I think Anki at this point will be timeless in medicine. I think it's gonna be just withstood. It's gonna withstand the test of time, but the cards will not. There's, you know, there's people that, that make these cards that give to the medical community and they come in kind of waves. And the next wave might come up with a better deck than Zonki did. And if that's the case, use the, that deck. My recommendation is you use whatever deck you feel is best for you. My personal recommendation, as someone who's taken step one, is to use Zonki. If you don't like Zonki, use Lightyear. Use something else. But whatever you use, be consistent. Don't let people talk you into doing something else once you've already started. Because that's also what gets you to that end goal of a 250 plus, 260 plus. It's that consistency you've given. You've given your all to, you know, Zonky, Lightyear, whatever, and you've done those cards over and over and over and over again. So don't, don't move away from what's working for you. Don't let others talk you into changing because that will diminish all of the work you've already put in. Anki, Zonki, my recommendation. Pathoma, great resource, Dr. Sitar, thank you. If you ever see this video, we really appreciate your contribution to the medical community. Um, I don't like reading books or textbooks, so I didn't read this. I didn't read the book. I watched all the videos though. They were great. I watched them at two and a half times speed. Efficiency, again, efficiency is what, because trust me guys, there's two parts to this. It's the studying, but also the wellness. If you can be, if you can study and then be well, you will do better in school, period. So I didn't read it because I didn't like it. 2.5 times speed. Uh, and then that's how I learned my pathology. Simple as that. Um, again, Zonki has pathoma built in. It has first aid. It has, you know, topics that are through Boards and Beyond because Boards and Beyond is of course built on kind of first aid a bit. So it has all the information you need. You just gotta find tags to unlock it and, and you'll learn that. And you can watch, you know, other videos specifically on Anki and Zonki and the specifics of tags and all these things I'm talking about, but I'm giving you a, the study method to a 265 plus. So, uh, you know, bringing that up, First aid is right here. Now, what did I just say? I, I hate reading textbooks. You know, I can read, I obviously like reading, but I hate reading textbooks. Uh, I think it's inefficient. And I think this book is garbage. I really do think it's garbage. I'm gonna tell you right now, 
And I know there are people cringing right now. I really don't like that book. Um, I think the way Boards and Beyond has integrated it into a video system is phenomenal. I think Boards and Beyond is superior in that regard. And if you learn through watching videos, Boards and Beyond over First Aid any day of the week. Um, I also think of what I've seen in First Aid, uh, the way they lay out everything, uh, you really can't learn from it. And that is different than Pathoma and you know Boards and Beyond, which are meant to be learning resources. This is a review resource. But you want your learning and review resource to be the same, in my opinion. You don't want to, you know, use this book in any regard to learn because there are so many things missing. Uh, so many kind of bridges between topics and things like that where I, I think it kind of bullet points everything really great. And what I, I did is, you know, I had a online copy or, you know, or I would flip to a page if I needed some refreshing on something that I saw in Zonki and I wanted like the bigger picture in terms of all of the bullets of this thing. But I don't feel like first aid um, really allows you to make those bridges between topics. I think it's great for single topics where it would be like, yeah, this is pulmonary fibrosis and you can read about the pulmonary fibrosis and it gives you kind of the great overview but it doesn't give you what you need and another thing is that step one is about not just your grasp of the knowledge and the physiology but also your recall of facts and reading first aid five times over is not a great way to memorize facts period I know that's a method people have used back in the day, but now we have Anki. It makes it so much better. It makes it part of your, your entire being versus reading this book over and over and over again and getting tidbits here and there. And again, like, like I was saying, like it's good if you need to kind of get a brief overview of a topic in a, in a single sense, but if you need to build those bridges between topics, which is what you need to do to become a doctor, I don't feel that first aid is the way to go. So if you're using first aid to review, uh, Definitely don't use it to learn. If you're using it to review, that's your own choice. I don't recommend it, and I don't think that's the way to get to a 265 plus. So now, you know, we can talk about Boards and Beyond real quick. Like I was saying, I use Boards and Beyond to learn physiology. I was a bit late in the game in terms of Boards and Beyond. Um, I didn't start using it until into second year, and I think it's a great resource for physiology. Again, Pathoma is better for pathology in my opinion, but Boards and Beyond is like first aid, but on steroids because it explains, it teaches, and then you can watch to review or you can use Anki. Like I said, Zanki has everything you need and it's a great way to keep on learning and learning and learning, reviewing, reviewing, reviewing. Um, but Boards and Beyond for physiology. So now let's talk about question banks. Like I mentioned before, UWorld was my core question bank and the only one I used. Um, no matter what, question banks you use, you will should be your core. It is the gold standard. It has been the gold standard for a long time. It's kind of a monopoly to be honest. And it is, it's great. It, it tests you in a way similar to how the real thing does. And the explanations are unbeatable. I mean, they give you explanations for why the answer is right, history behind it, and then also why all the wrong answers are wrong. And you can't beat that because that's how you learn and that's how you test your knowledge. Um, there are a lot of philosophies behind how you use your world. Some people say do it twice. I think that's a waste of time. I think if you're gonna if you're gonna do a question bank, do it once, do it well, and then do a different question bank. Um, you will be amazed at how much you remember from something you get wrong, and then I think it's just a waste of your time and inefficient to redo those. And even more so, it's a waste of your time and inefficient to do a question bank twice over uh, if you've already gotten a question right. Um, I don't think that it doesn't test your brain in a different way. Uh, if you're gonna run through it the first time really kind of shoddy, um, if you're gonna run through it the first time 
pretty badly and then not really review it and then do it a second time over, I think that's a waste of time. Uh, do it once, do it well, use it well. If you want more questions, use a different question bank. I don't have any recommendations for other question banks because I didn't use any other question banks. I know I had friends that used USMLE RX, uh, Kaplan, Amboss. Uh, I can't give you a recommendation for that because like I said, I did UWorld, I did it once, I did it well, and that was it. I do think for most people there's a correlation between how many questions you do and how well you do on the test because questions are what uh, allow you to see what knowledge you actually have and where your gaps are and it teaches you as well but um, for me I felt like you world was enough and my score reflected that if I did another question make could I've gotten a 270 maybe would doing a, another question bank, an entire question bank, have been worth four points to me? Absolutely not. So, as I, you know, I'm super happy with my score. I'm happy I only have to do one question bank to get that. Um, but that's a personal choice. But I do want to say that I think questions do correlate to score. So the more questions you do, the higher your score will be. Just because the test is can only the question can only be written in so many ways and if you see a certain topic like pulmonary fibrosis we'll use if you see that in 10 different ways before your actual test the odds of them asking you it in a different way is very minimal um, for me my brain works so that when i read a question i actually try to think how else they could ask it and i you know i recommend making that a habit if that's not already a habit for you because I think that's what allowed me to only do one question bank and still receive the score I received. Because when I'm reading a question and then after I answer it and you know I read the, 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 all of the explanation, uh, I'm thinking, well, how else could have they asked, how, how could they have asked me this question? What are the ways they could write this question? And in what ways would the other answers that were incorrect this time be correct? Um, so that's my recommendation to you. Now, in terms of timing and like dedicated period, I, I finished Zonki in its entirety with no new cards left before um, about two weeks before I started dedicated. Maybe maybe three weeks before I started dedicated. I was still in the in my GI block, which is the last block at the Mayo, uh, the Mayo Clinic, and that's a four week block. And I tried to finish all the cards really before it, but I think I finished all of them one week into the block um, because I was able to learn GI because I had two weeks off before GI, so I spent three weeks learning GI on my own. Um, and that class, the lecture wasn't mandatory, so I just did what I needed to do. And throughout medical school, obviously I kept doing the cards from other blocks because that's how Zonki and Anki works. <clears throat> Excuse me, you do the cards, for a certain block and then you keep on doing them and you learn them and the interval lengthens and then you know spaced repetition that's the way to learn now <clears throat> the card count can get overwhelming for all my Anki users and for my future Anki users my methodology behind it was uh, at the beginning of second year well in the first year I think three to four months as an interval is completely acceptable and then as I got to my second year, I length, I just decreased the review interval, the time interval, to 100, around 100 days. And then as I got to December, and I took my step one early May, so as I got to December, I reduced the interval more and more. And I recommend the lowest interval to use and the interval you should go into dedicated with is 50 days. 45 to 50 days is as low as you should go because otherwise, the count and the amount of cards you're doing in a day just gets too overwhelming and you're gonna get burnt out. I think 45 to 50 days is a sweet spot. 50 days is really more than enough. Don't go lower than that. I will be honest with you, there was a point at which I went to 21 days because that was the interval I, I realized would allow me to see every single card in the deck that I'd already seen you know, a thousand times, twice during Dedicated. I, that was a terrible decision and I'm glad I figured that out before dedicated because I, I set it to that interval well before dedicated because I got burnt out really quick 
set it to like 50, 60 days and I was so happy I did that because during Dedicated, I was way more comfortable. Um, I wasn't burnt out and that's the name of the game, guys. Do not get burnt out. If you get burnt out, you will score poorly, period. Because your studying will be won't be at its apex each day and that's what you need to do well on this test. You need to be fresh every single day dedicated. Now, so 50 days for that review interval at its minimum, 45 to 50. And then in terms of questions, UWorld has like a ton of questions, like 2,800 questions now I think I saw. And they add questions, you know, every week. So my recommendation is you start off early with UWorld in terms of if you're only gonna do it once through, I think for me, I started in May. February is a good time to start doing questions. A block of UWorld is 40 questions. Uh, I started with like five to 10 questions per day because there's a bit of a learning curve for how you go about doing these UWorld questions. You'll get used to it, but at first it takes a long time because you do the questions and then you review and you read all the explanation and you just don't know how to do it efficiently and you get more efficient as you do more and more. So I recommend a taper up. And I, re I had, I would say 2,000 questions left when I went into Dedicated. So I started in February, I did my taper up, I took a brief hiatus for like a month from doing questions, and I ended with 2,000 questions to do in six weeks of Dedicated. Now, my Dedicated basically looked like a, a six day work week in terms of, I'd wake up at 5 a.m., I'd do two blocks of UWorld, which is 80 questions, and then uh, that would take me until around 12 to 1-ish. And then after that, I would take my lunch break. I would exercise a little bit, maybe an hour, an hour and a half for lunch slash exercise. And then I would do my Anki reviews for the day. And that can go as quick or as slowly as you want. Uh, I'm a little OCD about it, so it probably took me longer than it needed to, but I got done by around dinner time, and after that, you know, 5, 6 p.m., it's time to relax. I watch Netflix, I chilled with my family, chilled with my girlfriend, um, and basically, so that would be my schedule for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then on Friday, I would do my NBME exam. And the NBME exams are liquid gold because they're good predictors. They're actual old step one questions and they're sold by the NBME. They're a little pricey, but you gotta do them. It's an investment in your future. And so I would do those on Friday. I'd review the questions I, you know, I just did. So I would do it, it's five hours. You're a little burnt out after, so I would review as much as I could. Uh, and then I did my Anki for the day. And then Saturday, I would do one block of you world, so 40 questions, review that, review the rest of my my NBME exam, and then I would do my Anki for the day. And then Sundays, the best day of the week, I would just wake up, I would do my Anki, and the rest of the day was off. You gotta take time off, guys, otherwise you'll get way too burnt out. It is just incredible how how great you feel after just one half day of rest. Give yourself at least a half day. And that day was just dedicated to relaxing, spending time with my girlfriend, you know, giving the people I love the time of day because all I've been doing was studying all week. And that's important too, guys. Don't forget the world keeps spinning even though you're studying for this test. And, and giving thanks to the people that are giving you support is very meaningful. So, that's what my week looked like, uh, rinse and repeat. And that's basically what I did for six weeks. I also did both UWorld practice exams, which are important to do. Um, they overpredict, I would say, a little bit, uh, specifically UWorld 2, the UWorld 2 practice exam. Uh, that definitely overpredicts, but uh, they're important to do. And then, I also did the free NBME 120 exam, which is just a free exam given by the NBME that is kind of like the other exams you did. Um, but it's free questions, so I did it. 
Um, and I feel like the real thing for me was a lot like the NBME 120 mixed with some U World. Um, but it's a hit or miss, you never know. That's just what it was like for me. Um, I definitely recommend doing the U World exams and the NBME 120. Uh, and of course, all of the, and as many of the NBME exams that you can afford slash do, uh, I say afford lightly because, you know, take the loans out if you need to, because these are, this is again, an investment in your future. So, but you need to pace it out so that you do as many of the NBME as you, as you can, but also fit in both U World Practice exams and the NBME 120. The NBME 120, I, w I was finished with U World questions by the, you know, the end of my fifth week, I would say, or ver the very early beginning of the sixth week of studying, and the sixth week of studying was the last week. So I then didn't have any more U World questions to do, and I did the NBME 120 on like a Wednesday versus like I used to, I, as I said, I did the, my, my normal NBMEs on Fridays. Um, so that, and the NBME 120 is only 120 questions, I believe. And the, so the timing is less than the other practice exams you've done. So try to, you know, balance it out like that. That's kind of the bare bones of my schedule though. So four days of UWorld, NBME review, well, a block of UWorld the next day, which is a Saturday, and then reviewing the rest of the NBME. Sunday, half days off after doing Anki. Um, and that's about it, guys. That is what I did. Uh, if you want me to make a write-up, I'm happy to do so. Just leave a comment down below, uh, a dedicated write-up for how really I exactly broke it up. I know that some of you may want to follow my schedule to a T and I'm happy to do that for you if there's interest for it. Otherwise, I think I was pretty specific in this video. If I was unclear about anything, please comment below and I'm more than happy to clarify. Uh, and overall, good luck guys. This is a long road. You know, we go through undergrad, we do the MCAT, med school, step one, then comes residency. It's a, it's a long marathon, and what I want you to remember is that as long as you work hard, you'll end up where you want to be. Don't let, let the test define you, but understand the importance of it, respect it, and go in full force because you only got one shot. You cannot retake this exam unless you fail it, and if you fail it, it's going to be hard to uh, match if you're trying to match into a very competitive subspecialty. Um, one more thing before, you know, we end this video, I came up with kind of a percentage of what I think the step one is on a, if I was to break it down into a hundred percent, 20% of step one is innate intelligence, 60% is, is your studying and hard work and 20% is luck. You can fill in. 10% of the innate intelligence and 10% to 15% of the luck with just sheer hard work. So you can get to 80, 85% with really, really, really hard work. I wanna emphasize that because it takes, it takes a grind. But that 10% luck left in just innate intelligence and the 10, five to 10% left in, in luck, you can't shift. But that 80%, 85% of definite hard work that you've put in will get you the score you need to match into any subspecialty in my opinion. I think with just absolute sheer destructive hard work throughout your didactic medical school, throughout all the medical school, but for step one, throughout your didactics, and then into dedicated, studying for step one, if you have grinded throughout this whole thing, I don't see why you couldn't get at least a 245. And that, really that's enough to match into any subspecialty. And that's a fact, don't let any anyone else tell you otherwise, because that, what I'm saying to you right now is based on data, 245, will get you into pretty much any subspecialty. Now, yeah, you're gonna be more competitive. A 250 plus will get you 
you, you, you'll have smooth sailing, let's just say that. Um, 260 plus, obviously. I mean, you're gonna have even smoother sailing. But 250 plus is what you should be shooting for because that opens every single door. Whether you wanna be a dermatologist, a neurosurgeon, or a family practitioner, 250 plus will do it for you. Um, it'll keep every door open. Uh, but just remember that you're more than a number, even though it may seem like one number defines you at this moment, but just remember that all of you are going to be phenomenal physicians and that one day, hopefully we will be able to change it so that this test is less meaningful than it is now to the future of the medical students who come after us. Thanks for watching.